Well, good morning, church. What a joy to be with you on this day after Christmas. Glad to see all of you that are here that made it. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas uh, celebration with friends and family. And uh, but most importantly, I hope that, like me, you're just rejoicing in in the birth of our Savior and being able to celebrate that most momentous uh, occasion. Now, church, by God's grace, we're back uh, for our last message out of the book of 2 Corinthians. So if you pl please turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Again, by God's grace, we have now come to the conclusion of our study of this epistle of 2 Corinthians. And um, it is my prayer that as we have gone through this, that has uh, proven beneficial to you as they ask for me, for sure. Now, through our study, uh, we have come to realize that very much like churches today, the Corinthian church was in a uh, volatile condition. It had weakened itself by compromising with the world and legalistic religion. Paul, knowing that he has said everything that he needed to say in this difficult letter, but yet loving letter, concludes by appealing to the Corinthians' heart and their mind. Now, at this point, it was up to the Corinthians, it was up to the Corinthian church itself to choose to either get healthy or continue to decline. The choice was theirs. As a church's spiritual father, the Apostle Paul, his heart was that they would heed his exhortation and repent from their error and seek restoration and unity in the church for the sake of Christ. Now, toward that end, Paul then concludes his letter by exhorting the church to do two primary things. Number one, to put themselves in order and secondly, to unite in truth. So, beginning in verse 11 to verse 14, this is what Paul has in conclusion of his letter, and we shall read it. Paul then, concluding his letter, says, Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to us and through your instruction to us and of us. Father, as we've gone through this letter, no, we pray, Lord, that as we've come to its conclusion, you continue to be glorified as we seek understanding into a pastor's heart who lovingly but yet sternly has rebuked his church and is exhorting them to get it together. Father, we must admit that in some senses we're not very different than the Corinthian church. We after, often need rebuke, often need loving reminders, especially when we see ourselves compromising with the world, when we give ourselves to division and misunderstandings in the body of Christ. Lord, we at point, at times, see a little bit of the Corinthian church even in us. So, Father, we just ask that you be glorified now as we conclude this most wonderful epistle. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, when it comes to the health of a church, which I suggest to you Paul was very much interested in, the Corinthian church was sick. It was volatile. And as a spiritual father, he, he grieved for them. He grieved for their, he, he longed for their purity and uh, their understanding. He longed for them to be united. We understand that in his absence, false teachers crept in and began to wreak havoc in the church at Corinth by uh, having them question the apostle and his teaching. And needless to say, the world infected the church. And obviously when that happens, there's many problems that arise. So as we 
look at this text, what I'd like to do is share with you five realities for a healthy church. Given that, that's believe, given that I believe that that is what Paul was, was yearning for, that the church in Corinth would become healthy again. So we're going to look at this text through five realities of a healthy church. And the first, I suggest to you, we find in the first half of verse 11, and that is this. A healthy church addresses any dislocation within the body. A healthy church addresses any and all dislocation of the body. Notice what he says. Finally, brethren. Here the Apostle Paul begins his conclusion by addressing the church as brothers. This is a term not only of endearment, but also a term that displays Paul's confidence that he does not yet consider the situation at Corinth irreversible. Yes, perhaps there are some false converts in the church of Corinth, but as a whole, Paul, by, by, by reminding them and calling them brethren, I suggest to you, uh, sees them as genuinely, genuine brothers and sisters, but also sees them as a church that is not beyond the work of God in them. Now, even with all the problems in the church, Paul still considered the Corinthians as Christian brothers and sisters. I hope you can see that. He knew that all was not lost yet. There was still hope. Now, the Corinthian church may continue to grow in grace and knowledge and influence and love as long as they take care of their issues that were dividing them against the truth. Therefore, as you see in a series of five imperatives, Paul makes a final appeal for unity and harmony in the church at Corinth. Now, as we have read, Paul does not want to exercise church discipline upon anyone. He doesn't want to do that. That's why he wrote this letter. But he will if he must, for the sake, obviously, of the purity of the church of Christ's bride. So his prayer is that the Corinthians would heed his exhortations and not force him to uh, not force him into church discipline of disciplining the church. So to his brothers and sisters in Corinth, he writes, "Rejoice." Now, very similar, or like the Jewish greeting of Shalom which wishes peace upon the hearer, here Paul uses uh, a farewell of sorts. So, farewell of one of rejoicing. Now, of course, even in the difficult situation that the Corinthian church was, and, um, and, him, and Paul himself found himself in, concerning the Corinthian church, there was always reason to rejoice in the truths that unite them, Namely, the gospel of Jesus Christ. As I mentioned before, for Paul, it was not the end. There's still hope for that church. Now, Paul meant no ill will towards the Corinthian church. Even though they had mistreated him terribly. In fact, they had sinned against him in the way they treated him. His desire, however, was that they would simply return to the basics of the gospel that they had received from him and abandon all false teaching that was contrary to that which Paul had taught them while he was there, when he established the church. Therefore, if the Corinthians heeded his warnings before he arrived, then there is reason at least in Paul's mind, to hope that he would not have to hold them under discipline. They can rejoice, therefore, in that God loves them and that Paul, even as an apostle, also loves them. See, here he wants to reassure them that he has not written them off, that God loves them and that he loves them. And again, I would suggest to you this is one of the reasons why he wrote the letter, to warn them, to exhort them. So Paul, notice, continues by exhorting them to not only rejoice, but to be made complete. In other words, Corinthian church, listen, please. With the love of God, with the love that I have for you, put yourselves in order. Here is where we begin to see what Paul saw as the Corinthians' responsibility. Paul says, church, put yourselves in order. 
the verb translated here as be made complete not only has the sense of growing in maturity, but in this verse, most directly speaks to restoring something to a former condition. This verb is the same verb used by Paul in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, which reads, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, here's the same word, restore. Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourselves that you also will not be tempted. So here he is calling them to put themselves in order, to restore themselves to a point that they used to be as in a healthy church when Paul found, as when Paul found it. Now, as we see in verse 9 of the same chapter here, of chapter 9, of chapter 13, Paul prays for the recovery of the Corinthians. Notice what he says. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray, that you may be complete. Paul, he prays for the restoration of the Corinthians. Presumably, from errors in thought and action. So here then, the exhortation to the Corinthian church is to put themselves in order, that is, to reset themselves, to restore themselves to the spiritual condition they had enjoyed while Paul was in their midst. They were a very strong church. Now, of course, Paul is in no way implying that they are to rely solely upon themselves to accomplish this, but instead, as they examine themselves, according to chapter 13, verse 5, they are to return to the simplicity of the gospel as Paul had taught them. They had moved away from the simplicity of the gospel. They have moved away from the the, the, the simplicity the sim Simplicity of the, the reality that they are saved by grace through faith alone, not of works. And regardless of or regardless of their gift, spiritual gifting, of their wealth, of their supposed uh, intellect and wisdom, they had forgotten the simplicity of the gospel. And sadly, they were trusting now in their own works and their own abilities when it comes to spiritual gifts. They were trusting in other teachers who they deemed uh, better than the Apostle Paul. They were eloquent. They were perhaps even more, more educated than the Apostle Paul. They came with recommendations from Jewish leaders. But the sad part is that these Judaizers were sadly like their claim to fame. They were putting the church back under, under the law. And Paul, here is exhorting them to go back. Church, take care of restoring yourselves. Now this required that they, they stop listening and following false teachers. Whereas God worked in their heart to convict them, they were now responsible to address any dislocation in the body and restore them. Whether it be division, or false teaching, they needed to restore that which had been dislocated by the questioning of biblical truth and by the welcoming of false teachers. In other words, Paul can be saying, take care of your spiritual issues, Corinthians, and make them right. Now notice that to this exhortation, Paul adds that they are to also be comforted. Here, Paul seeks to instill in his brothers and sisters Courage and comfort. Paul knows that the church takes the responsibility, if the church takes the responsibility seriously, is going to be very difficult. It's going to be very difficult to kick these false teachers out. It's going to be difficult to address a schism or division in the church. And perhaps some need to seek forgiveness of one another. And that's hard. So Paul knows that if they do heed to his exhortations, it's going to be difficult. So here, he wishes them to be comforted. He's wishing them to be courageous and comforting. Again, Paul knows that if the church takes it seriously, their responsibilities that they are to do is going to be difficult. They're going to need to be encouraged and need to be comforted. Now, when it comes to this restoration, if you will, let us not forget that restoration requires other people. And I think I want to spend some time here. 
Um, l- let me read to you a quote by, by Wearsby that, that really grabbed me when I read it, when he says, Balanced Christian growth and ministry is impossible in isolation. Someone has said that you can no more raise one Christian than you can raise one bee. Christians belong to each other and need each other. A baby must grow up in a loving family if it's to be balanced and normal. The emphasis today on the individual Christian apart from this place in a local, his place in a local assembly is wrong and very dangerous. And I thought these were very wise words because think about this. Here Paul is giving them some exhortations, commands if you will. All of these are imperatives. And he's saying for one, rejoice, be made complete. In other words, be made complete or not only the, the sense of maturity, but reset yourselves. Take care of the issues that, that, that are, uh, are plaguing the church and take care of it. And one could run the risk in, in, in perhaps looking at certain individuals and saying, okay, we'll take care of it. We're not sure if there were elders. Probably not yet in this church. Um, and I would suggest to you that's probably one of the reasons why many of the first uh, century churches, prior to Paul's ad- admonition to, to Timothy to est- put uh, elders in the church, was, I would say, that ran the risk of simply what we see in 1 Corinthians, is, is that who was the leader? Who was in charge? Now, obviously, Paul the apostle is, is their apostle, and in a sense, the, they're their elder, but he wasn't there. And in his absence, false teachers would come in and, and ascertain to, for themselves uh, authority. So here we see that as the command goes forward, that they were to um, be, be made complete, they need to be restored. It's imperative that they understood that it's not just the, per, the responsibility of one person, but it was a responsibility as a church as a whole, responsibility of the church as a whole to do that. Now picture this, even in our time, beloved, how hard would it be for the church to address its divisions, to address its schism, to address things that may be dislocated within the body without understanding that it requires the whole and not just one part of one one part of the, one part of the church. There are problems. There are problems in the Corinthian church, and I'll suggest to you that there's no there's there, there's a high likelihood that they will not be successful in the restoring of themselves if the church as a whole does not first and foremost understand that there's a problem and that it is a responsibility, with God's help, of course, with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, to fix things at least to address things. Beloved, as the church sees to address any issues or dislocations, if you will, within their local body, there must be, they must be an understanding that it is a responsibility of the whole of the church, not only of a few. Now we hear of, uh, like I mentioned, we hear of no elders in the Corinthian church, but if there were, this would have been part of their responsibility. Now, I'll suggest to you that this is one of the big reasons why Paul instructed Timothy later on to appoint elders and deacons in, in, in Ephesus, and has, henceforth from that, from that point. Now, I gather that if the Corinthian church had elders, as we understand them today, they could have uh, fared much better. Now, knowing that Satan is always on the alert for weaknesses in the church, Church leaders must stand and guard against any false doctrine and division within the body. That's one of the primary responsibilities of an elder a group, a plurality of elder. Now, uh, elders, if, this, if there's dislocation, if there's division as there were in the Corinthian church, then the church, through its appointed leadership, is to restore the body. But again, this is, this is the, not only the responsibility of elders, but the responsibility of the whole. Now, beloved, I suggest to you that this is a re- reality of a healthy church. They must address any dislocation in the body of Christ. This is a command, this is an exhortation that Paul was given the Corinthians in his conclusion of his letter. Corinthians, set your affairs in order. Get it together. So that's the first reality. Second reality for a healthy church is this. They must unite in truth. Unite in truth. 
Continuing in verse 11, next imperative, he says, be like-minded. Now, given the factions and divisions within the Corinthian church, Paul prayed for a restored harmony among the brethren. Now, think about this. How can Satan cause discord in the church? Well, just like he's always done it, by questioning truth. He did it in the garden, and his methods have not changed. The Corinthian church suffered from division. This we know, for example, based on what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, where it says, And I exhort you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no division among you, but that you would be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. That sounds very familiar to what he's saying here at the end of 2 Corinthians. So we see that the Corinthians were divided because they had moved away from the standard of truth, the gospel, as had been presented by the Apostle Paul, and sadly began to listen to the wisdom of man, the wisdom of false teachers. Soon, unsurprisingly, they found themselves strained from truth. There were many claims to truth. There were those who said that Paul was perhaps an okay teacher, but that there's other truth outside of what he was teaching. So therefore, Paul, we see here, he exhorts the church to be of one mind, one that is based on gospel truth. Now, we must be clear, Paul is not asking the Corinthians to agree to agree on everything. That would be impossible. His exhortation is that they would be bound together in truth. Be of one mind. In truth. This was vital for Paul, for as he says in verse 8 of the, of, of the same chapter, where he says, for we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. And loved ones, this is a vital reality for a healthy church, upon which, uh, oh, so, uh, upon which standard is the church founded? The Corinthians were divided because they, were, they, they, they veered from the standard of biblical truth as it was presented to them by the Apostle Paul and began to drift away and began to heed the, 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 the erroneous teachings of men who wanted to put them under bondage. And I would say to you that the same thing happens today. The moment a church starts questioning biblical, the biblical standard, standard of truth, then there will be division. Look at what happened in the mainline denominations who have abandoned biblical inerrancy and infallibility of the Scriptures. Once you jettison the doctrine of biblical inerrancy, infallibility, and sufficiency, then you open the door to horrendous doctrines. Horrendous. These mainline denominations who are declining in membership, they're, they're, they're dying. They have, in short order, have adopted homosexuality, women pastors, critical race theory, transgenderism, and the list will continue, beloved. Because once you abandon the biblical, biblical truth, inerrancy and infallibility of Scripture, you open up the door for everything. Why has this happened? Because they have rejected the biblical standard of truth. And that is why we can have no fellowship with organizations such as those. Why? Because we are called to be of one mind in truth, in scriptural truth. We can't have anything to do with them because we are not like-minded. We are not of the same mind. That one's biblical Christian fellowship is only possible when people have biblical truth in common. This is why there was division in the Corinthian church. Remember, one was of Paul, one was of Peter, one was of, of, of Christ. They were, there were factions. They began to listen to false teachers who began to have them question what Paul had taught them. Division. Division. 
They were not of one mind. Again, biblical Christian fellowship is only possible when people have biblical truth in common. Outside of that, beloved, there is no Christian fellowship. Now, beloved, this is why I say that, you, that, that one must check the doctrinal statement of churches who, where, when you plan to visit and perhaps even join. This is why church councils and confessions of faith have proved beneficial throughout church history by helping people remain in fellowship with like-minded people. If you do just a cursory study of church history, you'll understand. Now, you might be saying, man, look at all these councils. There was infighting, there was a backbiting, and why did you need a council to, 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 to determine the, the, <clears throat> the doctrine of just the, the triunity of God or the, or, or, or the Lord's table or uh, baptism? Beloved, it's because unless you, have, uh, unless you are one-minded when it comes to biblical doctrine, you really can't have fellowship. So all throughout church history, we see councils and even, even, even confessions of faith that have been penned for the reason, for this reason, that those who read it can say, I can have fellowship with this person or this group or this church because we are of one mind when it comes to the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of man. Very, very important. Now, Unless the Corinthian church would be like-minded in biblical truth, division would continue to erode the church. That's why doctrine is so vitally important. And that's why the, the doctrinal statement of a church is so vitally important. Because we said, this is the, the, the doctrine that, 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 that unites us in, in of, of being one in mind. Now, we can have differences of opinion on secondary or tertiary issues. But when it comes to the core... We have to be of the same mind. Otherwise, there's going to be division, there's going to be schism, and that's going to be an open door for the enemy to d destroy, as he was trying to do in the Corinthian church. So unless the Corinthian church would be like-minded, division would occur, the church will continue to erode. And I would suggest to you, beloved, that the same goes for any church today. It's sad that there's many churches that don't make a big deal about doctrine. They see it as, a, as, a, as, a, as that which divides. And we're saying, amen, it must divide. Unless we can unite in biblical truth, there is no unity. There is no fellowship. And if there is no unity, please note, neither will there be peace. Look at what he says. Live in peace. That's the next exhortation, the next imperative. Live in peace. Beloved, peace is the natural result of being of one mind. Why wasn't there peace in the Corinthian church? Because they were not of one mind. Not to be, therefore, of one mind is to invite division and strife into the body of Christ. This is why Paul then Feared as uh, this is what he feared, as mentioned in Second Corinthians chapter twelve, verse twenty, where he says, "For I am afraid," Paul says, "For I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you to uh, to be not what I wish, and may be found by you to be not what you wish. That perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disturbances." Beloved, how can anyone live in peace when these sorts of things were going on? And besides that, how can a church accomplish its goal where there is no peace within the same? One of the church's primary duties is to be an example to the lost world. To be the conduit through which the gospel is shared with the lost. How effective do you think the Corinthian church was when there was strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, gossip, arrogance, and disturbances? Why then, here's the question, why wasn't there any peace within the Corinthian church? Because they were not of one mind when it comes to biblical truth. 
Listen to what it says in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 50, when it says, Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is what the church is called to do. Our saltiness will be worthless, will be actually no longer salty in, in a positive sense if there is no peace. Beloved, this is why Paul was saying that Christians must constantly strive for church unity and harmony, but that only could be accomplished when we are one in mind in biblical truth. One in mind in biblical doctrine. Now notice that the chief benefit of thinking and striving for this state of being is, notice, and the God of love, Paul continues to say, and peace will be with you. Paul is here telling the Corinthians that God's blessings awaits their right and responsive action. Now, obviously, they're not only to do this just to be blessed. But, beloved, there is a wonderful, uh, um, uh, f- there's, uh, there's the wonderful fruit of obedience. We see that all throughout the Old Testament. If you obey, you are blessed. If you disobey, you are lovingly chastised. Loved ones, God is the God of truth. Where there is no truth, there is no peace. Because where there is no truth, God is not there. And neither will His love Neither will this peace. Truth is everything. Biblical truth. God is true. It describes who He is. He's the source of truth. There's no, nothing could be truer than God. Now notice that Paul here calls God the God of love. Interesting, because this phrase is not found anywhere else in the New Testament. We know that God is love, but never is, uh, except for here, is he uh, addressed as the God of love. Though, I will suggest to you, the idea is in Scripture, obviously in Romans 5.8 and 1 John 4.16, of course. Now, sadly, there was not much Christian love manifested in the Corinthian church. Backbiting, they were, there was jealousies. We talked a little bit about the, 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 the horrible thing that they've made of the Lord's table, the love feast. It was horrible what they were doing. There was not much love manifested in the Corinthian church. Paul, therefore, was hoping that the presence of God, uh, God's love and peace would be an incentive to encourage the Corinthians in the same. Now, we know, beloved, that also a sign of a healthy church is when you see love, genuine love for one another. Therefore then, a healthy church is one who must address any dislocation in the body. Second, a healthy church must unite in truth. And third, a healthy church must display genuine love for one another. And this we see in verse 12, simply by this phrase, Paul says, church, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now evidently, this was a common practice in the early church, for we see it mentioned in Romans 16, in 1 Corinthians 16, in 1 Thessalonians 5, and in 1 Peter 5, 14. The holy kiss. Now according to commentator Baker, the holy kiss expressed union and fellowship with one family of God. And perhaps it was also a sign of mutual forgiveness and reconciliation that was exchanged before the Lord's Supper was celebrated. And I I, I like that. I think that's that's spot on. Think about this. The Lord's Supper, as instituted by our Savior, was a time where the church would gather, when they did gather, and they were to examine themselves that they might partake of, of, of the elements in a the, in the, in the worthy manner. And during that time, where remember, it's not just a worship uh, communion service, but it was a feast, it was a gathering, it was a fellowship. 
And at this feast, you could just imagine, if there was division within the church, it would be the perfect time, most opportune time for somebody to go and seek forgiveness. To repent and seek forgiveness of a, of a brother or sister whom they have offended or sinned against. So it is possible that, can you imagine, it's very hard to approach somebody, and even if you don't make, you, you think of this holy kiss, and you think about even, even in, 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 in Europe where you see that there's really, sometimes they don't even touch, they just do the, the mannerism. But let's just say, it's kind of, kind of weird for us in our Western context, you know, some guy come in planting two kisses on my cheek. Um, but you can just imagine how, how hard that would be if I wasn't right with that person. If I had not, if they had sinned against me and not, not asked for my forgiveness or vice versa, how hard would it be for me to, as a family that gathers for the Lord's table, to greet them that way? So here, the, the concept of a holy kiss is not only cultural, but it's highly significant in that you can't do it unless you really like that person. And sometimes... It's hard to like the people in the, in the church, in the fellowship. But he says, greet one another with a, with, with, with a holy kiss. Now, it, was, it is uncertain whether the holy kiss was shared between men and women, although most likely, most likely it, it was not. We're not. We don't know for sure. Again, this holy kiss was to symbolize family life. That's what you do with family. That's what you do. Perhaps even you and your own family. Now you have your, your grandpa, your dad, you know, uncles, brothers. You go and just give them a hug and a kiss. Again, the holy kiss was to symbolize family life and to show <clears throat> that each member of the Corinthian church considered every other member as part of one family. Now in addition... As commentator Martin states, Paul hoped that the kiss would be a sign of forgiveness and reconciliation, and as we will see shortly, the exhortation to give a holy kiss was not unique to the Corinthian church. It was not unique. And in fact, even in, in, in Middle Eastern and even in European countries, that is still very much the norm. Now, as far as we are concerned here in the Western, in our Western context, I would suggest to you a simple handshake will be enough. But if you want to do the holy kiss, I, I mean, just be careful. I would say, again, a nice handshake probably will suffice. So, a healthy church then must address any dislocation in the body, must unite in truth, must display genuine love for one another, and fourth, they must realize that they are part of the larger whole. And this goes along with what I said previously. Notice in verse 13, all the saints greet you. You know, for Paul, it was very important that the Corinthian church understood that they are not alone, that they are part of a larger whole. The Philippian church, the Ephesian church, the church in Thessalonica, Corinthians, they all greet you. Now, if you were a believer in perhaps, let's just say, the, the, the Thessalonian church, just north of, of, of Corinth, and you heard what was going on, you're probably saying, can't stand those people. But that was not the case. Paul wanted them to know that all the saints greet them. They're part of the body. You're part of a whole. And all the saints greet you. Your brothers and sisters in churches other, outside of the, the, the Corinthian area, they greet you. So do you see that he's reminding them, you're still part. You need to take care of your affairs, but... God loves you, I love you, and you have other, other brothers and sisters in other, uh, in other regions that greet you, that also love you. Now this guides us so to our last reality, and that is this. A healthy church not only should realize that they are a part of a larger whole, but they must also rest in the reality of the triune work of salvation. What a wonderful, wonderful benediction this is, beloved. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, Paul, here, Paul grounds his pastoral appeal for restoration and unity and for the rejection of division in the theological doctrine of the Trinity. 
Now, was Paul seeking to teach on the doctrine of the Trinity? I don't think so. Nevertheless, notice how it just naturally flowed from him. This is not a treatise on the triunity of God. It just flowed from, from Paul. And I love, again, how Baker puts it so wonderfully when he explains that the grace of Christ banishes self-assertiveness and self-seeking and that the love of God puts jealousy and anger to flight while the fellowship created by the Spirit leaves no room for quarreling and factions. Now, although not stated in the order that one would think, most of the time you start with God the Father, then God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Again, although not stated in the order one would think, the order in which Paul presents it nevertheless reflects the Christian experience. For think about it. It is through the grace of Christ that we get to experience God's love as we are placed in fellowship with the Father and the Son through the Spirit. That's how we experience it. And it's just a wonderful reminder for this church, not only the Corinthian church, but even for our, that we are called to rest in the reality of the triune work of salvation that we've been so blessed by. Beloved, we are bringing this year to a close. And as we do, let us rejoice that we, by God's grace, are a well-ordered church, despite your human leadership. We're faulty. We're fallen men. And soon next year, God willing, we're going to add another faulty man to the group of God's soul wills. But let us rejoice that as a church, we'll, for the most part, very well ordered. Let us rejoice that we can have fellowship because we stand fast upon the truth of God. Let us rejoice that we display a genuine love for one another. And not only to taking, you know, uh, taking care of one another, but as we gather to greet one another, to take care of each other's needs. And we see that in this church, and it's fantastic. Let us also rejoice that we display um, the, 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 the reality that we know that we are part of a larger universal church that prays for each other. We're not lone rangers, Christians here. We're part of a larger whole. And our responsibility is, as we are healthy, I see it as also strengthening the church universal. Lastly, let us also rejoice in the reality of the triune work of salvation in our lives. Beloved, without that, we would not be here. So as we bring this year to a close, I ask that you would rejoice in these wonderful facts. Rejoice that God has put us all in this wonderful church. Not a perfect church, but nevertheless, just a great church. And beloved, as we prepare our hearts and minds to, to start the new year and a new book in, in Galatians, that he may be just absolutely glorified as we continue to share in our being of one mind in the Scriptures. Amen? Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this year. You have been so faithful to us. Even at times when we've been unfaithful, you've never ceased to be faithful. Father, we thank you so much for your Son who you sent that he would live a perfect life so that one day he can die in our stead. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your obedience to your Father, for living perfectly, for fulfilling the law perfectly, for dying in our place, for resurrecting, putting the just the final death nail on that coffin, ensuring our resurrection along with you one day. Precious Holy Spirit, we thank you that you, as our resident teacher, instruct us. You convict us. You have placed us in the fellowship with Christ through the baptism into the church. We are so grateful to you.
Lord, we pray that as we bring this year to the close that we continue to glorify you. And we pray, Lord, for this coming year that it would be a wonderful year. Of course, it's not going to be free from trouble and strife because that's the nature of the world. But Lord, may we be better. Will we gain greater knowledge that we may grow in love and patience. Lord, we just thank you that we have your word around which we can have fellowship. You are the standard. And because of that, we can call each other brothers and sisters in this place. And again, we do thank you so much. It is in your name that we pray. Amen.